Welcome and happy Hanukkah. We are happy to host uh, at Dr. Golik Academy today. Uh, we are in the second lecture of the Energy Week webinars here in Dr. Golik. I'm excited to host Martin Van Dijk uh, from Holland, engineer and area manager in uh, Metlom Autolab. I hope I said it okay. Yeah, good. Uh, today we are in a lecture about uh, batteries, overview, application, and uh, actually he will tell more about it. If you have any question during the webinar, feel free to write it on the chat here below, and we will answer and respond to it in the end. And I'm just going to move the mic to Martin. Hi. Hello, hello. Thank you for uh, the introduction. Um, welcome everybody to the, this lecture uh, about batteries and their applications and overview of what we can do with uh, battery research in general in combination with our uh, instruments. Um, so I will give you a small outline in the beginning. So, yeah. There we go. So, uh, a small introduction about batteries, uh, tell you more about the parameters and units and vocabulary we use normally, uh, some examples of lithium ion batteries, and what we can do with our NOVA 2 software uh, with respect to the battery application, and also talk about our hardware and some special accessories which can be used in battery research. Um, and also tell you more why this technology is most important uh, uh, in battery research. And electrochemistry is, is of course, it's, um, it's one part of the battery research, but also one of the most important parts. So that's um, the outline of my talk. And uh, we'll start with the introduction. Well, probably a few of you already know a lot about batteries already and know about how they construct, but just to rehearse a little bit, is that general speaking, a battery is a device that can store energy in a form of electrical charge. And there are three main components of a battery. You have the anode with the material on it and a cathode with another type of material on it. And in between you have the electrolyte and the separator. So that constructs a battery. Um, the anode and cathodes are material is coated on a metal as a current collector. And they are electrically separated by a non-conductive separator, which you see in the drawing, which allows basically the movement uh, of ions, but does not let the electrons pass. So uh, we have the movement of ions inside of the battery and the electrons goes uh, around it. And um, so that's the, the, the whole configuration of a battery. And um, that's in, the most important part of the battery is that what kind of material you uh, immobilize on the anode and on the, uh, the cathode. That's the whole study of how to construct and also the, itself the electrolyte, what kind of electrolytes are you using and what kind of separators. So the whole battery construct is, uh, is an advanced, well, you can do all kind of research on all, each part of the battery. So this, uh, general rule then we have uh, primary and secondary batteries of course we have the primary batteries which are one-time use and um, like the lemon cell where you stick a, a zinc na a nail or a, and a, on the anode side uh, zinc is oxidizing and on the other side you have a copper part which is reduced at the cathode so in there you have a, a small voltage difference between those two points and then you have creating energy with this very simple uh, uh, battery construction. But of course, the alkaline batteries are also uh, primary batteries. The secondary battery is uh, rechargeable. So for example, your car battery, your lead acid battery, or the lithium ion battery, which you have in your phone. And um, yeah, that's, that's main, these are our main uh, study at the moment to have uh, to study the lithium ion batteries. And we have want to replace the lithium nowadays with uh, magnesium or for, with sodium, for example, for example, to have a better, um, uh, because lithium is running out basically, and we have to find another way of constructing a rechargeable battery. 
So the primary battery has a one-way chemical reaction and a secondary battery uh, can be recharged within a reversible chemical reaction. So that's the main difference between the two uh, battery types. Okay, so that's done. Then the applications, well, lithium ion batteries or rechargeable batteries can be used in many different ways. Uh, electronic vehicles, for example, uh, power grids, medical applications, uh, uh, personal electronics, portable devices, but also military applications like drones and all kinds of things. So batteries are getting more and more, of course, imported. They are imported already, of course, but it's getting more and more. The, the, the storing of energy in the future will be more and more important than we ever know. And um, uh, the main thing to remember is that for different applications, uh, one battery technology only is not suitable. So it really depends on the application and the environment and the duration, uh, what kind of battery range of technology you have to commercialize. So it is, so not only one battery can be used for all applications. So there's a lot of technology behind it. And uh, the researchers are now to find out which technology is the best for which application. Okay, then um, in some history, in 1991, uh, Sony first commercialized the lithium ion battery and uh, by substituting the metallic lithium with graphite carbon as an anode to overcome the safety challenges uh, the metallic lithium had, avoiding dendrite growth of lithium. So that's the first commercialized uh, uh, lithium battery and you see an exponential growth from 1991 with the published papers and patents which were uh, published uh, during that time. And uh, for example, the, the, the impact on portable electronics like a cell phone, you see a huge growth of that uh, commercialization. And that's, uh, yeah, that's also the research you know, research is following where the money is going so uh, also a lot of money is invested inside of the battery research because of this uh, portable application and uh, especially in the in china and, and in some asian countries like japan and korea big companies like samsung um, lg um, big uh, chinese companies are investing a lot of money in developing the most effective and the most efficient lithium ion battery. So that's that's the growth. Uh, for the future, well, the future uh, we have to, because lithium is running out basically, so we have to find the sodium ion or magnesium ion or a different type of lithium uh, combination salt to, uh, to create the alternative for the lithium. And that's also a huge research field um, which we are active in. And uh, so nowadays researchers are working on promising alternatives also and uh, for higher energy uh, and also higher efficiency. And of course, our outlook instrumentation is suitable also in this new field of research. Uh, also for sodium ion batteries, uh, the researcher will need a potential stat to do the experiments on their batteries. So that's important to understand. So this is a small introduction of battery research uh, as, it's, as it is at the moment. All right, well, we start with some parameters and units and vocabulary. That's important to, to have some definitions understandable to how to define, for example, the capacity or how to do what kind of language lingo the battery researchers are working with. For example, uh, some useful units, of course, charge of one electron is uh, minus 1.6 to the minus 18 uh, coulomb. That's the charge of one electron. But if you have one molar of electrons, uh, the charge is uh, 96,485 coulombs, which is equal to one farad. And the capacity is the charge of 6.2 times to the 10 to the 18th of electrons. So um, that's the 
the capacity is the charge transferred in one second by one amp of current. So a capacity equals the one amp per second. And that's basically the, the most used uh, value which is used by the battery community at the moment. So then that if you transfer it into an hourly rate, uh, amp hour is the most used unit in battery community to report the capacity of a battery uh, and also the capacity of electromaterial for a battery. So that's where amper hours is one of the most used terminology in uh, battery research. Um, yeah, that's that's a little bit about where this amp hour is coming from because it has to do with how much current is transferred per unit of time. Okay. Then some other vocabulary. We have the voltage. Well, voltage is the difference between the potential between the positive and the negative electrode or between the cathode and the anode. Then we have the capacity, the amount of stored charge. Uh, the current is the number of charge transferred per unit of time. So that's related to time. That's the current. And we have energy is how much work is done. And then you have power in watts and how fast the work is done. So it, it all depends on time and the amount, basically. So these five uh, units, you have to also be aware of when talking about capacity and voltage and current and energy, all these things. Yeah. Okay. Then specifically for batteries, we have um, other type of vocabulary like the SOC, state of charge, uh, DOD, the depth of charge, uh, then SOH is the state of health, the columbic efficiency, and the cutoff voltage. Well, with a healthy new battery, you could usually use basically 100%, which is the upper right uh, drawing um, of its capacity. So it's when you have a pure, healthy, never used battery, you could use 100% of its capacity. But as soon as you start to use the battery, the fading of the battery starts, which means if you look at the used battery drawing, there's a gray area which represents the unusable part, which of the faded capacity, which you cannot retain it anymore. It's gone capacity, basically. And that's this part here. If you can see my pointer, I can, maybe I can change my pointer to a laser pointer. Here we go. Here we go. So these are is unusable at the moment. Um, so the state of health is the remaining capacity. That's this part here, state of health. The state of charge is the percentage you see on your cell, on your cell phone, for example. How much charge does the battery has left? So the state of charge, this, this is what's left in the, in the battery. The depth of charge is actually the empty part, the white part, plus the non-retainable part, the gray part. So that's the depth of charge. And the columbic efficiency tells you something about the um, efficiency, about the cycling rate of the charging and discharging of your battery. So there is a, a certain uh, amount of times you can charge and discharge a battery until it loses its uh, energy. And then we have the cutoff voltage, and in which the voltage is possible where the lithium battery can be operating between. So for example, um, it's a certain potential in which the battery can operate. Like, for example, is the um, uh, between three and four point two volts uh, of a lithium ion battery. That's the cutoff voltage. That's a range in where the lithium ion battery can supply the energy. So these are also specific um, parts of a battery, and battery community is using to define the the state of a battery. Okay, for charging and discharging, that's also an important part of the lithium uh, ion battery. We use another term and it's called C rate. And C rate is the measure of the rate, the speed at which the battery is fully charged or discharged. So uh, the battery specialists or researchers are using one C rate, for example, which corresponds to a current at which it takes one hour to charge or discharge battery. That's one C. At two C, uh, 
C, right? So at two C uh, speed, that corresponds to um, to a current which is needed to take so a half an hour to charge the discharge the battery. And uh, so, for example, when you have a phone uh, battery, it's a healthy and you can charge it in one hour. That means that the charger that you're using for the manufacturer uses a one C C rate to charge the battery on your cell phone. So that's also important. So how fast can you charge at which uh, current? Well, I'll give you an example. And so, for example, we use a battery from Samsung with a capacity of, uh, let's say, 2.6 uh, amps per hour. And if we charge it with one C in one hour, we need 2.6 amps to do that. Yeah. So we have a current of 2.6 amp, so we can charge it at one C rate. But if you use a current of 2.260 milliamps, uh, then we charge it at 0.1 C rate. So it will take 10 hours to charge. And that's also important to know. Um, we have different options to, ch to charge the different uh, C rates. For example, when we use a current of 2.6 amps, the battery will be charged within one hour with a one C C rate. And also you can do that for many different types of C rates. You can calculate yourself how much charge, how much current do you need to charge the battery? No, that's uh, the C rate. But the C rate has an effect uh, on the battery. You cannot, you cannot apply uh, a very high current for um, at a very short time. So there is a, a limit, an effect on the battery. So the, that's also important to understand is that each current will have effect on the efficiency of the battery and the charging itself. For example, this is a schematic of the, the cell capacity. So at high C rate, we have the faster charge and discharge, but less capacity. And that's uh, shown in this, in this plot. You can see at the 2C rate here that you have a less capacity at the end. So that's why we don't charge with, for example, with your cell phone. Uh, your cell phone is not charged within an hour. So it takes a longer time with a lower current to charge your cell phone with the best capacity. Um, because what's happening, we don't want to charge quickly by just applying a high current. And why don't we charge our cell phone actually just in six minutes? The reason is that all the battery chemistry will lose capacity when using a higher current. But loss of capacity has many different reasons, which are not going to discuss during the webinar, but there are a lot of chemical reactions going on inside of the battery. And you can also see in this graph that the high C rate, you will have a drop of the battery voltage. So you see the, the voltage drop from 4.2 volts down to 3 volts, uh, meaning you will get a smaller energy density. And that's also the effect of uh, a high C rate charge. So this is the reason why we charge the cell phone uh, in a few hours instead of a few minutes. So that's the C rates, state of charge, state of health, uh, construction of the battery. That's the vocabulary and the beginning of our uh, knowledge. Okay. Well, when we go to lithium batteries, well, lithium batteries, if we look at a lithium battery, uh, how does it work? Well, uh, it is so-called the intercalation mechanism. And on one side, you have the anode side, uh, it has the graphite on and the cathode sides where we have the transition metal. So this is the transition metal part where we have the lithium uh, cobalt oxide layer, for example, and on the other side, your graphite layer. And um, so there are many different ways to construct this, this layer, this the, the anode side and the cathode side, of course. So 
at the moment, uh, yeah, you have the graphite lithium cobalt oxide. That's the most common used at the moment. So uh, when the lithium ions uh, batteries are manufactured, uh, they are in a discharge state. So lithium cobalt oxide on one side and on the pure graphite on the other side. During charging, so you're applying a positive current, lithium ions are deintercalating from the lithium cobalt. So lithium is going from this part here to the graphite. And uh, so from the lithium cobalt oxide, this means that the lithium ions are moving out from the cathode through the electrolyte and the separator two different graphite layers of the anode. The movement of electrons, so the movement through, uh, for example, a lamp or your cell phone, whatever, are in the same direction of the lithium ion and stops when all the active lithium ions has moved from the cathode to the anode. And when this happens, when all the lithium uh, are moved from this part to the uh, anode, then means that the battery is 100% charged. So this is the, the, the charging of your uh, lithium ion battery. Well, of course, we also have the discharging of the lithium ion battery. And um, so when, when your battery is ready to use, you can turn on your cell phone or a lamp or to start a discharge process. So thermodynamically, the discharge reaction is favorable. As soon as the circuit is closed, the lithium ions will move from the anode side and integrate back into the cathode, to their initial state. At the same time, the electrons move in the same directions. So you see from the same direction from the anode to the cathode. Uh, and the electrons are consumed by the cell phone, for example. And so basically, the charge and discharge is the shuttling of lithium ions back and forth from the anode to the cathode and back and forth. So it is just the, 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 the shuttling of the lithium ions between the two layers. That's how a lithium battery works. Well, when we go to the next, we have a lot of components inside of a lithium ion battery. And uh, uh, for example, you have, a, you have your coated. Um, Copper current collector with graphite plus binder per carbon black, for example. Then you have your positive electrode with uh, also with a binder and carbon black and your lithium uh, cobalt oxide. And your separator, which is soaked by uh, conductive for ions or non conductive for electrons. So there are a lot of parts inside the lithium ion batteries which uh, can be studied. And People are studying all these materials and they're studying the coatings, they're studying the, the binders, they're studying the, the carbon black and what kind of lithium oxide is used, what kind of graphite is used. So there's a lot of study going on of each fundamental part of a lithium ion battery, but also what kind of electrolytes and what kind of separator is used. Okay. Um, then we have different types of cell types at the moment, which a lot of people are using to study their uh, material. And uh, of course, the cylindrical part uh, is a cell type which is used. Well, the cylindrical part is most of the time used uh, for long term measurements only. So, when a long term testing of charging and discharging, uh, people construct their lithium ion battery into a cylindrical shape, and then uh, it is used like that. The pouch shell, uh, this one here, they have a flexible polymer casing and are mainly used to study different electrolytes and failure mechanisms. You can buy these empty pouch cells in dry format and fill them with your own developed electrolyte, for example. And then you can test them um, as a pouch configuration. Then we have the Schwedgelock uh, cell. That's a nice uh, construct which you can construct in uh, a glove box, for example, where you also can enter a reference electrode inside. So a three electrode system instead only to a counter and a working electrode. Also auxiliary electro of a reference electrode can be uh, put inside the cell itself. 
and also can be reused. So once you've made your construction, um, you can use it again with another material or another electrolyte. And this is used for post-mortem analysis. This means that uh, after a charge and discharge cycle, you do analysis on how the material uh, has reacted to the, the charges and discharges, how the surfaces changed during this charge and discharge cycle. So that's the post-mortem analysis. Well, the coin cell holder, the, co well, the coin cell types uh, are the most used actually. Um, it's easy to construct and it's cheap. So it's easy to, to construct a coin cell. And unfortunately it's only one time use, but it's very easy to construct and it's cheap material to work with. And finally, we have the high-end cells, like the advanced cells, which we also sell from uh, Metromore's lab, is that we can heat up this cell up from minus 40 degrees up to 100 degrees centigrade. And that's a nice thing also nowadays because, uh, well, battery cells and battery studies, we need to know how the material is behaving at different temperatures. And with these advanced cells, we can uh, program the software so we can do the tests at different ten temperatures from minus 40 degrees up to 100 degrees. And that's a nice uh, feature as well. So different types we use for R&D environment. And um, well, there are two type of, type of cells which we use. Uh, we have the full cell, so the complete construct of the battery and the half cell. And the half cell, we only look at one side of the battery. For example, we only look at the anode or we only look at, at the cathode. And uh, the full cells, well, you can construct the full cells with all these, um, which I've shown you previously. So the, the advanced cell, the pouch cell, the cylindrical the coin cell, and the spatial lock. So you can construct a complete uh, full cell uh, with these uh, cell types. But the half cell uh, is needed if you're only interested in one part of the battery. So if you're only interested in, in the anode material, if you're only interested in the cathode material, then um, people are working with half cells. And half cells can be constructed with our advanced cell, the coin cell, but also with the Schwage lock. So that's the, also for the terminology, half cell or full cell. Yeah. Of course, lithium, well, reacts with, um, oxygen, uh, water, and nitrogen. And that's why most of the construction is done in a glove box of a new prototype of, uh, of uh, lithium battery. And um, so you, have to, you need to have a feed through uh, from, an, from, the, uh, from the potential stat to your cell, uh, to your, yeah, what you've created inside the glove box. Uh, to your yeah your battery cell, and well we, you can uh, request uh, that your cell cables of the potential set can be with uh, BNC connectors, and these BNC connectors are isolated isolated BNC connectors that don't make contact with the the wall of the glove box, so it is just um, um, only the core is connected to the to the inside of the, um, uh, what do you call it, to the cable, the extension cable inside the glove box. So it doesn't touch the surrounding of the wall of the glove box. So it's completely isolated. So that's possible as an, uh, as an option, uh, if you want to, if you work in a glove box and you want to test your sample inside of the glove box, then we can provide special cell cables with a special BNC connector. You can also put the PG set inside the glove box. Of course, there's not always that much room in a glove box, but we have very special compact uh, potential sets like the PZ-101 and the PZ-204, which goes inside the glove box. That's also possible. And then you can only use a, a USB cable, which is easier to adapt to the, to the glove box as well. Okay, um, that's the glove box. Then if we look at our software, uh, we have uh, Nova 2 software, and um, the nice thing about the Nova 2 software is that we can uh, we can program it the way you want it. 
basically. So there is, we have, we don't have uh, fixed uh, procedures. Yeah, we have some fixed procedures about 80 default procedures, but you can modify the the way and how the commands are uh, organized. You can have total freedom in setting up your procedure yourself. And that makes Nova2 a very powerful software for research because you can imagine that you can combine different techniques with each other just in one procedure. And that's a nice, a nice feature we have with Nova. Um, but the most important thing is, of course, the uh, charging and discharging cycles. That's the most important type of uh, procedure which is used in battery research, but also impedance spectroscopy. And I'll tell you, look, make a little bit more about impedance spectroscopy later on in this presentation. And, uh, but of course, oxycline photometry and galvanostatic intermittent titration techniques, so GITT, but also potentiostatic intermittent titration technique, it's PITT. There are some fundamental um, advantages of on these techniques. Okay, let's let's start with the first one, the, the the charging and discharging cycles. The nice thing about this is that we can just apply a current, positive current uh, or a negative current, or so positive current for the charging, a negative current for the discharging, and uh, we can program it in a repeat loop. So we can put everything in a repeat loop, and we can group the charging cycle and the discharging cycle together in one group. And then you apply a certain current, switch a cell on and record it for a certain time. The nice thing is that we can also define the cutoff value. So from which voltage should it uh, stay between? For example, we've shown you in the, in the beginning of this uh, presentation, the voltage was between three and uh, 4.2 volts. So we can set the upper limit and the lower limit of that voltage range. So it can stay within the boundaries of uh, your battery. And that's done with the cutoff values. Um, yeah, and you can loop it as much as you like. Then we can set the upper voltage, the, the cutoff voltage, when the voltage becomes higher than 4.2 volts. What does the Nova software needs to do? Well, you stop the command and then it goes to the next command, which is the discharge cycle. So it will, um, uh, you can set any type of cutoff value with respect to what you're measuring. So the potential. And when the potential becomes higher than 4.2 volts, then it stops the command. And then it goes back to the uh, three volts. And then so on until the cycle is finished. Then we can also set up uh, C rates and the higher the C rates, uh, also you probably need higher current. At the moment we have the, for example, PSA302N goes up to two amps, uh, two amps maximum. And if you need, if you have a very low resistance type of battery and most of the time, your battery is a, is a low resistance battery, I'm talking about milli ohms, you need to have high currents. And we can go up to 10 amps or even 20 amps if needed. And that's the limit of our capabilities. We can go, can go up to 20 amps where we can apply 20 amps to your cell. So it depends a little bit on the C rate you want to use, also depends on what kind of currents you need to apply uh, to your cell. Then we have cyclic photometry. Well, with cyclic photometry, we'll find out the redox peak potential of the material used. Uh, it's not very common in um, in the battery research, but of course, CV uh, cyclic photometry is a very powerful technique where a lot of electrochemists are using it to, to find out uh, more understanding of the material they work with. Then we have the GITT, so the uh, galvanostatic intermittent titration technique. So we're actually titrating with very small parts of current. So each time we apply a small current for a certain duration. And uh, after the duration, we stop, we, we switch the cell off, then we leave it at OCP, so open circuit potential. This means that the, um, uh, the current is zero. There's no current flowing. And uh, at that time, we measure also the, 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 the decay of the voltage. 
uh, during the OCP. So we see the drop of voltage when we switch the cell off, and so we're measuring the OCP. And then again, after the duration of 10 minutes, we start to apply the current again. And this is repeated up till the upper voltage is reached. So the, we, we just apply small parts of currents and we do that in, in also within a relaxation state as well. And that's called um, intermittent titration technique. So, so uh, titrating with small currents. And well, the discharge is just a reversible part of, uh, of this as well. Well, how this is set up in the software? Well, we have, uh, we have a charge part and a discharge part. So we charge it first with small steps of current with respect to OCP. And then uh, we repeat it until we reach a certain cutoff value. And that's important to understand. You set the voltage cutoff in at which cutoff you need to stop. So it doesn't depend on the repeat loop. So how many repeats it's done. It depends on the voltage cutoff you put in. And that's a huge difference. So you can do thousand repetitions, but you never know and will until it reaches a certain cutoff value. And we can program in that inside of the Nova software. That's a nice uh, technique. And um, the same thing uh, so looks at the, uh, the discharge step as well. How does it look like? Well, the re result is something like this where you have your uh, charge and discharge state. And uh, so the plot itself is almost similar to the discharge and discharge constant current cycling method. So if you only use uh, one type of constant current, then you see the similar. But if you zoom in on this part, you will also see uh, the relaxation state, also the, the OCP part. And the, the, the reason we do this is that from this voltage behavior of this battery, you can get the information regarding the diffusion behavior of your lithium ions into the material. So you have more fundamental knowledge of what's happening at each step. And that's, uh, that's the advantage of, of this technique. So it tells you more about the diffusion of your material, of the lithium ions into the material. Well, the same thing we can do with uh, PITT. So PITT is not very used, so, but that's, then you're titrating with potential instead of current. But most of the time people are using GRTT. But it's, it's, the, same, it's the same principle as we work with uh, GITT. Okay, but EIS, that's actually one of the most important, um, so electrochemical impedance spectroscopy is the most important uh, technique in uh, battery research. And um, yeah, healthy batteries has a very low impedance, like I'm talking about milliohms. And um, the moment you start using the lithium ion batteries, some internal parasitic reactions can take place and then you'll see the impedance is growing inside of the battery. Um, so, and, and in general speaking, we use uh, very low, small impedance material to, to construct our lithium batteries. But this resistance, so actually the resistance inside the battery is growing. And we want to see at each state of charge, so at, we, at each time of our lithium battery, we want to see how the impedance is changing. So we, do a, we can do a study on impedance spectroscopy uh, with respect to the state of charge. So we, a lot of researchers are doing uh, first with a full battery, they do an impedance measurement, and then they discharge it or for a certain period, and then do an impedance measurement again. And then they compare the difference between the first state of charge and the last state of charge. That's important. Well, the most important thing about EIS is that um, you have to understand it. <laughs> you have to know what you're looking at. And um, it, it is uh, the technique itself is very easy to implement. It's very simple to measure. You always get a result. You will always get some kind of graph or some, some kind of uh, plot. So that's not, a, that's not an issue. Measuring is not the issue. Interpreting the data, that's the difficulty. 
and I'll have some additional slides to it because I want to have a sidestep not only based on uh, batteries but electrochemical impedance in general. Because if we uh, look at impedance spectroscopy, um, you have to know uh, that it must be stable. So the conditions for getting a good uh, measurement, the during the impedance measurement, the cell itself has to be stable, has to be uh, don't has a, doesn't change too much during the measurement. And that's important. That the condition is very important in impedance spectroscopy, and also what you are applying. So the perturbation, so the AC perturbation on the cell itself must not disturb the cell too much. So how much, how high is the AC amplitude do you apply? Is it appropriate? Is it good enough? Is it high enough to get a good result? But is it also low enough that it doesn't disturb the cell that much? And um, yeah, that's a few things you have to consider when you're doing impedance spectroscopy. And, um, but also, that after the measurement is done, is that the model you use to, to, to model the, the, uh, the data is with respect to what you have and not some other influence. And that's also an important and, and difficult part of impedance spectroscopy. But okay, I will tell you more about this uh, in a few slides. But there must be some conditions to measure impedance spectroscopy is that you have causality stability and linearity within the measurement itself. And causality um, means that you are what you apply must resemble uh, what you get back. So I will explain to you later. So the results of the EIS uh, measurement must be validated. And uh, so we have to be you have to find out that these conditions are met. And for example, the first, first part, the causality part, the response is coming only from the perturbation. So the response is coming only from what you apply. You have to protect yourself from external um, uh, interferences, like for example, noise coming from electron motors, for example, which surrounded by uh, the, the cell or um, uh, whatever, or, Anything which can influence the cell with a perturbation has influence on the results of your measurement. So you have to work with shielded cables and connectors. Uh, you have to work with very short and, and high quality cables, uh, low noise environment, avoid pumps, fans, all kinds of electron motors, and also avoid line frequencies. So you sometimes, um, the, the building you work in doesn't have good proper grounding or good um, uh, stable, stable uh, 50 hertz or 60 hertz uh, harmonic uh, uh, power grid. If there's fluctuations in the power grid or bad grounding, then you'll see that in your results as well. So what you apply must be what you put in, basically. That's causality. But also stability. Um, the system, so your cell, your battery, must be stable during measurement. And uh, so there's no drifting or the, the, the voltage are changing a lot of your battery during the measurement. So you have to be very fast in your measurements and typical measurements takes not more than 200 seconds or less. And we can, do, we can reduce the amount of time you're gonna measure with a multi-channel approach. So the multi-sign approach and this multi-sign approach where we, where we apply multiple uh, frequencies on top of each other to have a faster measurement. Because if you want to have in stable conditions, you have to work very fast. And um, also what kind of, uh, at which point, so which D DC potential, for example, the at OCP, or, or do, where do you work in OCP, or do you work at, uh, do you work at, uh, at a certain applied potential, for example. So the bias voltage also has influence on the um, on the stability of your cell. Yeah. And then last but not least, the linearity. Um, so the response, so what you apply and what you get back must be a linear response, which means that it has to really have a, a relation with each other, a linear relation. And so uh, small amplitude to avoid 
pushing the system to the out of linearity, that's important, but it has to be large enough to get any type of response. So you'll see here, uh, most of the electrochemical systems, of course, are not linear over a broad range of potential currents, but if you, but some systems can be considered linear over a narrow enough range of applied signal. For example, most batteries have linear behavior in the potential region slightly above and below the open circuit potential. So if you stay around this open circuit potential, you are still in the linear region. So this slide, so the response is a linear response inside of your measurement. So we can measure the response also in real time with the NOVA software. We can follow this graph as well. A nonlinear response, you see something like this. You see that the applied potential, that's the uh, current and the response, of, uh, the red is the current, the current responded back, means that we have don't have linear behavior in our cell. And the moment we have something like this, then, we, then basically the, 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 the quality of your data is not the best, I would say. There's another way to test this, and that's done with the Lisa Zhu plot. And the Lisa Zhu plot is a plot which tells you something about, uh, again, the linearity uh, during the measurement. And a pure resistor has a straight line, and a pure capacitor has a perfect circle. But of course, uh, nature is not perfect. Uh, we have something in between, an, an ellipse type of shape. And a real cell usually gives an ellipse due to the contributions of resistive and capacitive elements at the same time. And that's why you see something like this. In the real uh, system, the shape of the Lisa Zhu plot usually changes with the applied frequency. So you see a change, and it can go from the beginning, it can change from a resistive behavior to a capacitive behavior. And that's, um, uh, that's a nice thing to see. But the most important part is that it has to be a symmetrical. Um, so look for the central symmetry as an indication of linearity. So the symmetry of the plot itself, if you have symmetry between the axes, then you can say, okay, my system is in linear regime. But the moment you have nonlinear behavior, then there's no symmetry. So you have no symmetry in your Lisa's view plot. And then, um, yeah, then you have to consider reducing the perturbation of the amplitude, for example, and uh, or you have to change uh, at the low frequencies um, of your measurement, you have to change the speed of the measurement. So, and the nice thing about NOVA is, is that we can, for each, uh, for each frequency you're going to apply, we can recall back these type of plots. So we can visualize for each frequency you're going to apply, this leisure shoe plot. And that's a unique feature in, um, in the NOVA software to visualize all these leisure shoe plots for each frequency. All right, if we look at the lithium uh, a coin cell battery, for example, then, then we have something like this. We do a measurement, we measure at OCP, we apply a switch cell on, wait for five seconds, and then we do an impedance measurement. We start with a star potential of a star frequency down to a stop frequency, and then we scan for 10 frequencies per decade. And this is our amplitude. So this is what we are going to apply on the cell. And um, the result is that in the first glance at, at high frequencies for 50,000 Hertz, for example, we have some kind of uh, resistive behavior, and then it will start to, to down to a capacitive behavior. You see that on the Lisa Zhu plot. And also you see phase shift in, um, in the signal between the potential and the current. And this also indicates it is behaving more as a capacitor. So you can really follow for each frequency how your cell is behaving. And at, at the end, of course, we will have the data quality. And the data quality is uh, we do the fitting of the data. And the data fitting is the most important, well, most difficult part of the whole impedance measurement, where we have, um, uh, this is, for example, a uh, vanadium pentoxide cathode and lithium alloy anode and non aqueous solvents in the electrolyte. Then we have, um, in the beginning, we have a small inductor. This most of the time due to the cabling or to the connection to the cell. Then 
we have the solution uh, of the RS, that's the separator electrolyte resistance, and then we have two parallel systems where we have the uh, resistance and constant phase element. A constant phase element is actually a, some kind of capacitor. Uh, there's the charge transfer processes uh, at the anode and the cathode and the solid electrolyte interface. Um, so these are some boundaries inside of the cell which are represented with, with these two uh, parallel circuits. And then we can do a fitting and at the end of the fitting we can get a report and gives you the error percentage of, of each element which we've used for that fit but also a, a chi-square value. And the lower the chi-square value, uh, the better the fit, basically. That's uh, the, the rule of thumb in regards to uh, fitting of the data. Okay. I should, what I talked to you previously is that also uh, a lot of researchers do a study about uh, a different state of charge and what the result is of the different state of charge they do a measurement uh, of the battery and you'll see the result of different uh, state of charge as well. You can also do an impedance measurement at fixed state of charge but at different cycle numbers. So you, you start with one cycle, do a measurement and then 10 cycles or 100 cycles and then you'll see how the impedance is changing with respect to the cycle number. And you'll see what the influence the cycle has on the internal impedance of your battery cell. So that's also an interesting uh, technique to use in your uh, battery research. Well, some hardware. Um, well, we have uh, modulus systems, we have uh, multi-channel systems and compact design instruments. So we have um, uh, these type of, it depends a little bit what kind of current you're going to apply. The modular single, si Systems has a two amps current range up to um, of 800 milliamp current range, and we can boost it up up to 10 amps or 20 amps if needed. And um, then we have some additional modules which is useful. For example, frequency response analyzer. This is done for electrochemical impedance spectroscopy. Then we can go up to 10 megahertz if needed. So that we have a special electrochemical interface unit, as we call it, the ECI 10M, which goes up to 10 megahertz. Uh, which, if you want to do uh, impedance measurements up to 10 megahertz, then you need to have the, the FRA32M in combination with the ECI10M and the PGS that, and most of the time it's a 32M. But that's most for solid state uh, electrochemistry, uh, solid state batteries for higher frequencies. With aqueous type of uh, research, uh, 10 megahertz is, uh, doesn't give you extra information. Of course, current boosters, 10 amps or 20 amp boosters uh, with the PX1000. The nice thing about the PX1000 is that we can follow the potential of the individual electrodes of a battery setup, like uh, the anode and the cathode at the same time, at different potentials, that's with the PX1000. And with the multiplexer, um, it's useful for large number of batteries. If you have a large number of cells to test in sequence, uh, then we can do that in, in combination with the FRA. 32M module, we can do impedance measurements at a large number of samples. And uh, that's uh, a standard battery cycler, which is just uh, from Arbin or, or what is it? Um, it's Arbin and Macor, yeah. Those two cyclers, they don't have impedance capability. And with this multiplexer, we can do that. But the multiplexer is a se sequential measurement. Eh? That's, you have to understand it. So it's one after each other. Okay, some additional accessories we have for battery applications. Well, I told you in the beginning that we have this uh, special cell set up where we can control small volumes of electrolyte, for example, from 70 microliters up to, let's say, one or two milliliters. And we can control from minus 40 degrees to plus 100 degrees. And this is completely software integrated. So we can control it through one software package, the Nova package. We can control the temperature and set the temperature of this cell and do your measurement. So you can program the whole sequence inside of one software package. And that's uh, interesting to have as well. So we can automatically control um, your cell. Um, so for in temperature measurements, 
uh, Microsoft gives you temperature and flexibility, solar state, lithium iron batteries, and air flight studies. That's, that's why this cell was developed. We have uh, a standard battery test cell, and um, it has a, a gold plated thermal block inside the PT100 temperature sensor. And you can do all kinds of charge and discharge tests at different temperatures. And you can test all kinds of active materials, electrolytes, and um, yeah, that's all what you can construct. Also some extension where you can put a lithium uh, reference electrode to it on the side, so you can put an extra reference point inside of your uh, uh, electro electrode construction. This is the, the inner part of that cell where you can have separators and your electrolytes and a lithium reference electrode inside of your cell with a certain pressure, which you can press uh, with a spring, which presses the material on top of each other. There are already a lot of publications of this material, of this battery done, uh, formation of solid electrolyte interface and constant potentials. A lot of um, where they've used this cell setup um, and yeah, in, in many different material research, in battery research, they are using this type of cells. Um, for example, impedance spec uh, characterization, mixed conducting interfaces between sulfidic super ionic conductors and lithium metal electrodes. So there are, there where they also use this cell. And another example, reconstruction of simulation approach verifies impedance der derived ion transport to torsity <laughs> of a graphite battery electrode. So there are a lot of uh, publications already with these type of cells um, uh, out there. Of course, there are many other cells available. Um, we have uh, to do uh, conductivity measurements at different temperatures or liquid or of liquid electrolytes. Arrhenius spots we can do surface analysis of, of material. Uh, we can test separators, uh, solid electrolytes, um, pellets, and but also Raman spectroscopy. There's a special Raman cell. So you can have your laser shine through your material at the same time as you do electrochemistry. So it's a very wide type of um, applications and uh, possibilities which, which we can use. And that's a, a nice advantage of this, uh, of this cell. Well, to end with a little bit simple cell, we have the coin cell holder. If you have your own coin cells, we have the special holder where we can put the four electrodes, working sense, reference, and counter electrode in a four-way electrode setup contact mode. Uh, these are gold-plated uh, to avoid corroding and for the best conductivity. And you can put two type of coin cells, one as a, as a reference point and the other one as your material. So that's the coin cell holder, which we developed as well. All right, well, that brings me to the end. Yes, within an hour <laughs> of uh, my presentation and um, and I'd like to thank you for your attention. Thank you. That's fast. <laughs> thank you very much. If any of you want to read an up note that uh, uh, Martin just showed us, just let me know and I will send it to you via mail or something. Um, if any question, just let us know right now and I will see it in the chat box. Actually, I can, there, is, there are no questions. I'm also inviting you all to join us tomorrow in another webinar uh, with the topic of batteries. Uh, batteries improving in performance and quality by Omar Schenkman and Stuart Walkfield from uh, uh, Modern Panalytica at 10 a.m. If any of you want to uh, hear that webinar, just let me know as well. Thank you very much, Martin. Thank you. Um, and thank you all for attending. It was a pleasure. And this um, webinar, as always, you can you could find in a few weeks in our website, in a few days in our website, and you can uh, reach it whenever you like. Thank you very much. Uh, stay safe. Goodbye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank <laughs> you.